realized a long, long time ago that you couldn't deliberately make pots with the kind of character that I was looking for. Hamadou used to say, good pots are born, not made, you know, and Cardew said, you never remember making your best pots. What I've tried to do is, is kind of create an environment in which the kind of pots that I want to produce can happen, you know, because you can't make them happen. Uh, you have to let them happen, really. And it's almost very often a question of, of not getting in the way too much and letting the materials speak for themselves. What I've tried to do is to set up um, a set of circumstances which allows pots to come out in a certain way because you can't contrive it. I mean everybody knows I'm not interested in fashions or trends or anything. None of us are. You know the people that you show in your gallery, we all make our work. We're committed to what we do. Uh, the problem with art colleges, it's a very artificial situation and you don't get any kind of insight into the practical aspects and problems of running a workshop on a daily basis, you know, a, a proper functioning, uh, hopefully profit-making workshop. You tend, as a student, completely focused inwardly in a very introspective way, and it's the very opposite in a workshop like that. You know, where Ray Finch used to come in in the morning, with bits of paper and he'd hand a bit of paper to each of the workers and written on this paper was what you were expected to make that day. Very often students have this obsession with searching for this elusive and wonderful glaze, you know, so they spend you know, literally weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks doing glaze tests. And because they've got this idea in their head of what they're looking for, they've got this totally blinkered tunnel vision. You know, all sorts of possibilities pass by them and they don't see them. That was put completely into perspective for me when Bill Marshall, he said, it doesn't matter what glaze the pot's got on it, as long as the pot's got vitality. And the other thing which has stuck in my mind all these years is something Richard Batchum said about selecting from what's offered rather than trying to engineer things or control things too much. You just have to look and, and be open and, and see what's there and select. The thing that I remember when I was a student and when I first left college and set up on my own People seem to be potters as well, you know, seem to be obsessed with the, the way, how much a pot weighed uh, when you picked it up. And uh, my own personal feeling is that this is kind of a, a legacy from all those years of industrial pots, which were, you know, thin and light and white. And I read somewhere about um, an exhibition that Hamada had in Tokyo, and I think it was his friend, Yanagi, who picked one of his pots up and said it was, he thought it was heavy. And Hamada said, uh, better too heavy than too light. I actually make sketches before I start making, just to um, jot down the ideas that I've got in mind for the next making session. As I'm going along, I, I make drawings as, as a record of um, things that I've made with a few little written notes 
uh, telling myself what what glaze or slip I intended to put on them. Um, the reason I do this is because making sessions are quite long, six weeks to two months, sometimes even longer than that. And although you may have a clear idea what you're doing at the time you make it, when you look back six weeks or two months later when you come to glaze it, um, you may not you know, uh, remember everything you had in mind. Um, but having said that, I don't always stick to the notes I've, uh, I've written. Um, something else may suggest itself at the time and I'll just ignore the notes and do something completely different with it. When you take that pot off the wheel, it's either worked then or it hasn't. And it doesn't matter what you do to it subsequently, it's never going to improve. I used to have an analogy which I used to, to tell students to try and get them to see this and it's like if you want to look really good as a person, if you're way out of condition physically, you're a mess, it doesn't matter how much you dress yourself up in expensive finery, you're never going to look good. But if you've got a great body, you know, jeans and a t-shirt, you look fabulous. It's all about form, really. I think the other thing is that matters a lot is, is qu the quality of touch on the clay. Trying to allow the material to speak, um, which is one reason why I work on a, a, a very light momentum wheel and why it won't go anywhere near an electric wheel. Because, uh, you know, the motor on a, an electric wheel, it's relentless. It's nothing to do with speed for its own sake. It's to do with the pot having freshness, not being overworked, things being done with kind of as economically as possible. So every time you touch the clay there's a purpose and a reason and uh, you, you know it's not handled. It's just like drawing or anything else or making a painting. You know you don't overwork it, you know. You, if you want the thing to be fresh and lively and have vitality, it's very important to, to do it that way. Bernard Leach said, when you're making a pot, even though you're making a, a three-dimensional object, you're not, what you're actually doing is, is drawing a line in space with your hands, isn't it? The clay's moving, but your hands are still. Or they, they're moving in a vertical direction and you're actually drawing a line. And Bernard Leach said, um, pay special attention to the beginnings and ends of lines. Uh, they're important. And if you do that, the middle will kind of take care of itself. Colin Pearson used to say um, about throwing, about his own work, he said, um, I, he said, I observe and when it happens, I stop. It's about surface quality which comes out as a, a direct result of the making process. And that shouldn't be disguised at all. That should be allowed to express itself. And I remember somebody else Collins said once, actually, because when I was a student, very early on, things like this used to worry me. You know, you pick a pot off the wheel with your hands, it, can it kind of distorts, or you your hands leave indents in the side. And, and I remember Collins saying, well, that doesn't matter. And I said, well, why doesn't it matter? And he said, because it shows it's been made in a certain way, you know. And at that point, I'd got a long way to go, you know, to understand really what, what expression in terms of making pots was. I mean, one of the things I'm looking for is um, the character of the turning. Um, so... I need enough clay there to, for me to be able to select when to stop. Um, if I just leave enough just to shave a quick shave off, then if it's not right, I'm done for because there's no more clay left, you know. So things like considerations of things like weight, I don't, I don't bother about that. If the turning looks fresh and good at that point, I stop. And if that leaves the bowl a little bit heavy, so what? And my own work, I think, um, it is rooted in functional pottery. And when I started, you know, it was in the mid-1970s in my own workshop. 
and that coincided with a time when a lot of people were, were moving out of places like London and buying small holdings in the country and trying to be self-sufficient. There was a whole movement, you know. I think Margaret Thatcher stopped that. It provided a, a, a ready market for, for handmade pots because they, they wanted them because it fitted in with their kind of, you know, lifestyle. And gradually that dried up over the years and I, I suppose really, have, have, over time have, have made less and less kind of what you would call basic domestic table and ovenware. I mean, somebody like Mike, for example, Mike Dodd, has continued to make those things, you know. This is one of my favourite techniques of everything that I do. And this, of course, comes from Korean pots from the 16th century, um, Hakami. Certain glazes uh, do their own thing. They, they are their own decoration, if you like, with a, a little bit of help from the kiln. But this is quite different because it's a decoration which I deliberately put on the pot. And I like it because it's kind of built up in layers, really. And it reminds me very much of working into a drawing or a canvas. You know, it's a similar kind of thing for me. And for this to work, it really has to be done unselfconsciously. That's what's important about it. If it's laboured, it looks laboured and then it doesn't work. Spontaneity is what's required. So the slip has to be brushed on almost without thinking about what you're doing and let the brush do the work, really. It's a technique which I like very much. Um, but I also think that it's kind of like an acquired taste. And uh, people tend, in my experience, to either love it or to, to not like it at all. It's like a lot of things, you know, you need to, you need to, to give it a little bit of time. And uh, it's, like, it's like beer, good beer, you know. It's an acquired taste, but it's worth acquiring, really. Walking on the fells is the nearest thing that I ever get to God. It's meditative and contemplative. And uh, the nice thing about that is, is up on, the, on the, the high ridges, you know, you leave all that um, crap that you have to deal with on a day, daily basis, all, you leave that all down there, you know. Just in the same way as when I go into the dojang, I leave all that the other side of the door. But I became interested in martial arts through pottery because um, the same kind of philosophy. It's, it's a form of mental and physical training, or development of mind, of mind and body. And it's nothing to do with violence. In fact, Taekwondo advocates very strongly non-violence. It's not a million miles away from, from what I do in the workshop. And the garden, um, it's very much a part of, of, of the way we live, being pretty much self-sufficient uh, from the point of view of the vegetable garden. But, you know, the vegetable garden feeds us physically with wholesome food. And, and the, you know, the, the other side, the roses and the flowers, and everything, they feed us spiritually. One of the things that I feel is really important about what you're doing in your gallery is you're promoting the work of potters in a way which has not really been done before by any other gallery or indeed by the establishment. I think it's really important, I can't remember who said it, but the quote is, there are no greater or lesser arts, only greater or lesser artists. And I think the sooner the establishment realises this and gives us credit for what we do, then the better, you know. Um, we've survived all these years, all of us, on the support of a loyal but very small band of, of collectors who appreciate what we do. It's very exciting, the firing, you know, I, I find it exciting. If, well, kind of um, quite awesome, really. Um, and I, I feel that um, it's, every time I, I kind of start preparing the kiln for a firing, it's like uh, 
waking a, a slumbering beast, you know. And you'll see during the course of the firing that it does, it comes alive. It's an amazing thing. Just doing this kind of work sort of prepares me. So I, I can start thinking about the kiln and, and firing the kiln. It just starts to get my mind into that kind of area. The, it's very hard not to imagine that the kiln has a life of its own, you know. Um, and it has a pulse, literally has a pulse, because, you know, the air is not sucked through the kiln in one continuous kind of draft. It, it, it has a, a heartbeat and it, it actually, you know, throbs like that. And as it gets hotter, it becomes more pronounced and you can actually feel the vibration in your legs, you know. Something not, to, you don't want to make an enemy of the kiln, really. When you're, when you're firing your work. Before the firing, I always make an offering to the kiln gods. I have a, a flower, a seasonal flower from the garden and a cup of wine. And there were those people that would have you believe there's no such thing as the kiln gods. Would you risk it in my position? I don't like firing the kiln, I must be honest, I never have done. I, I don't know many people that do and actually enjoy that process, but it's just something that has to be done. And I actually think I'm actually quite good at it. Uh, but I don't like doing it. And I, I wouldn't trust it to anybody else either, which is why I always do it on my own. I'm a little concerned that as I get older, I'm going to actually need some help. I can see that coming. The kiln is a, it's fired with oil and wood and it's a, a two-chambered oriental climbing kiln. Really. And it suits me perfectly because it's uh, midway between an anagama, which I think is probably technologically at this end of the spectrum, and a modern kind of downdraft kiln where you have pretty much complete control is at that end of the spectrum. And uh, the chamber kiln, you know, is kind of somewhere in the middle here, you know, which suits me because um, all the pots have a front and a back. And uh, because, you know, the part facing the heat gets more attention from the flame and, and, and the fly ash from the wood and the back gets less. Although we do try to, um, kind of minimalise that uh, by the way we fire and the use of, 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 of pine wood which gives a long enveloping flame. But because of the, the kind of way in which I work and the glazes I use and the results I want, then that kind of midway point suits me very well. And also firing with oil and wood. I mean, I have fired with wood alone, but I, I discovered that um, too much ash can spoil some glazes. By having oil as well as wood, I can control exactly how much wood I put in to get exactly the effects that I want. It's a very slow pace of life, really, which I feel you know, enables you to be in touch in order to try and make the kind of pots that I want. And I believe that, you know, that, that uh, the best pots are, are born, not made. <laughs>